Well, within your bulletin, there's a blue sheet that you can pull out and follow along with some of what I'll be talking about today. There's also some extra scriptures on the back and a large spot where you can write some of your own notes. So we'll take advantage of that. There should be pens in the pews in front of you as well. This morning, I want to talk about some of the things that we do here. I know the purpose and passion of the church, the purpose and passion of our life. This is what I had planned to talk about in the months gone past and over the past number of, of well, really the last week as some really difficult circumstances happened within the lives of people within our church and outside of our church that I've been involved in. It really helped me to kind of focus in on this same topic and to come to a, maybe a renewed understanding. It's not new to me, but a renewed understanding of why we do church. What's the purpose? Why do we come? Why do we get so passionate? Or why should we get so passionate about what we do here and how it really is life-giving? This opportunity that we have to come every Sunday morning and throughout the week, whether it's small groups or whether it's at a coffee table in a restaurant or a prayer meeting, the purpose and point of this is very important, not only to us, but also to God. Church is important because we were designed by God to be together. God's design for us was to live in community with one another. In the very first chapters of the Bible, we see the creation account, how God created everything within the world, and he created man, and then realized that just man was not enough, that we needed someone else, and he created a woman. In that verse in Genesis 2:18, he said, it's not good that man be alone. And so he went on, created woman, and from there on we see that life is never just as an individual, nor should it be just as an individual. Thousands of years later, when King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes in 4, 9 to 12, he talks about how our joys are better when when we celebrate with other people and how our trials are easier when we go through them with other people. And I'm sure that there are many of us here that recognize the truth in that, that when we can celebrate milestones in our life, whether it's a marriage or a birth of a children or finishing uh, school, all of these things, when we get to celebrate them with others, it's better. We have a better time. The joy increases. And when we go through difficult times in life, trials are much easier when we have other people along our side. Someone once said that when our joys are shared, they are doubled, and when our sorrows are shared, they are cut in half. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's absolutely true, isn't it? When you can share those sorrows, the hard times of life with others, even if it's just a listening ear or a shoulder to cry on, those sorrows seem to slowly go away. When there are things that we have tried to deal with on our own, It seems insurmountable sometimes. And same with the joys. The other people in our life make a difference to us, both in the good times and the bad times, which also tells us something about church, right? If those people are making a difference to you in the good times and the bad times, do you know that that means that you're also making a difference in their lives through the good times and the bad times? That if it's true for you and it's true for me, it's also true for the others that are sharing their life with us. Just by being here and celebrating with one another in this family and in this church, you are living life together. And you are encouraging one another through good and difficult times. This is one of the important things that church is about, that we are not individuals living on this world together, but we are people who are connected to each other in greater ways than we could ever realize. And the purpose of church, or what purpose does it serve? It's a gathering point for us to come together and to accomplish something that is greater than ourselves. In Genesis chapter 12, it's referred to as the Abrahamic Covenant. I'm going to 
mention a lot of these verses. I listed them all so you can look them up and follow them um, through at home and, and then more on the back as well. But in Genesis chapter 12, it's where God comes to Abraham very early on in the Old Testament and he says, I am calling you out for a greater purpose than just you and your family. He goes through and he says, I will bless you and all of your descendants. And he tells him to travel to a land where he's never been and he's going to find the promised land, right? And we can follow the story through the Old Testament. But it's not just that he will bless Abraham for his faithfulness and he will bless his descendants for their faithfulness. The covenant specifically says, I will bless you so that you can bless others. It was all part of God's plan, his redemptive plan, but his plan to show that we are in this together. That he could have went to each individual family unit and struck up a similar covenant with them, but he said there's something about people coming together in community and coming together for a purpose and a passion. We see that later in Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about how we are important to one another. In Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 13, he says that we need to be part of this family together. And we shouldn't give up meeting together. But he says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. He goes on to say, because each of you have a specific part to play within the church. The church is made up of all of the individuals here for a purpose and for their own individual passions for the life of everybody that is engaged and involved. Church is important because God wants us to be here. He wants us in community. He wants us living life together. And he wants us sharing that with others, both here and outside of this building. You know, we all have the same designer. We all have the same God who created us. And we all live life with purpose as well as needs. You know, we have a plethora of needs, both deeply deep needs that we have and and felt needs that we have. And and we can think about them, whether it's air or water. These are all needs that we have. We need shelter. We need a roof over our heads. But there's a deeper needs, deeper needs than that for life. Some of us need to ask questions and seek answers. We need to have an anchor, a center point, a reference in life. We need to figure some things out, and we need to gain new perspective from time to time. Many of us have a need to fit in or to belong, to forge a new kind of community. We need to feel alive or more deeply connected with God, to learn and to grow from Him. We need to feel useful and pursue what truly matters. Some of us need to rest and heal, and some of us need to express what is inside of us. Those are just a few of the things that we need and we need community for. We all have the same design and purpose and needs, and we all have opportunity to be involved in this church. In a community brought together by God and guided by His Spirit, it's an integral part of our lives because it helps us to live at our best, to live lives of purpose and passion. We are not just a set of individuals here. We are a church. We are a family. We are a community within a community, within a city, within a country. And God has placed us here for a reason. There's many, many different ways that I thought about um, developing this further today. But the key one that I want to mention and recognize, it's just one of the aspects of what we do as a church. But this is key is that we all have a need to belong. And that's what I want to talk about today. That we all have a need to belong. Through the culture around us, through the movies we watch, even through our work and friends, they tell us that we should be able to live life alone. And if we can't, we're weak or some way deficient. But that's not the way that we were created to be. If we try to live, our own independent, self-sufficient culture tells us that we should strive to be strong, tough, and solitary, especially when it matters most. That what other people do doesn't really matter, and what we do shouldn't matter either. There's a a poem, an old poem that many of you will recognize. It's by William Ernest Henley, and it's a poem called Invictus. And it goes like this. How many of you 
know the poem Invictus. There's a few. Some of you will recognize it after it finishes. It says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for the un- my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Now, if you think about the movies and TV shows and the culture that you may watch, this speaks of so many of them, right? I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It may make for good poetry, but it's terrible theology, and it's lousy psychology. It may sound good to us that we can do it on our own, It's not the way God created us to live. That even psychologists recognize that this is not the way that we can live a good life. Like it or not, you and me, we have needs. We need the food, water, shelter, but we also need people. Now, some of us feel this need more than others. But to one degree or another, we all have the need to feel loved. We all have the need to belong to something. And we seek for this in all kinds of ways. And I need to say that at the core, many of the ways that we seek to find belonging in life are not necessarily bad. God created all of our desires and passions and drives. But yet if we take them out of context, they can lead us far from where we originally are desiring to be. Sometimes they can go astray from God's original design, but at their core, at their inception, all of our desires and needs and passions help us to see and to know and to understand our Creator better. These past couple of weeks have been difficult on quite a few families within our church. Quite a few individuals as well. For many of us, Christmas is an amazing time. And for many others, the stress can sometimes seem to be too much to bear. I must say that the stress on families, and in particular couples, has been more prevalent this year than I have ever seen in greater numbers in years in the past. And what I want to ask you to do is to pray for us. To pray for us as a church. To pray for the families here and the family of the church and our community. You may not know who I'm talking about, and that's fine. But a church united in prayer is a powerful thing. I want to say that the things that we do in creating community and growing closer to God and inviting new families into our midst are things that Satan does not want to see happen. And I have seen this season so many different ways that I think Satan has thrown stumbling blocks in front of people. Maybe it's built up over time from our culture. Maybe it's something that's new that he brought into their lives at this point in time. At the same time, when we come before God and intervene, intercess, when we pray for others, especially as a church, united in prayer, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And that's what I want to ask of you over these days and weeks ahead. You don't need to know much more than that, except that I want you to pray. And today I want to focus on this one aspect of the church. Something in light of these struggles that are challenging our church families. And that is a place to belong. Because belonging to this group, belonging to a church, as a place to come together helps us because we were designed to be here. The purpose of this meeting 
meets the needs of so many of God's encouragements and commands to us in a way that nothing else can. He called us to meet together to encourage one another to never stop because he knew that we need each other, that I need you and you need me, that you need the people sitting around you just as much as they need you, which is a lot more than we often realize. And so as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a book, and I listed the book for you there. It's just a book called Why Church, published by the organization, an organization called Outreach. And in it, there is one chapter that talks about belonging. And some of the ideas come, I'm going to mention come from this chapter. Because I want to talk about what church is in the sense of a place to belong. Well, first, church is a third place. A place where everybody knows your name. It may not be the same amount of um, drinking as there is in Cheers. But there is an important aspect of a place where people just go to meet and greet and create. We call it fellowship, right? To have community with one another. So it's like the show Cheers, sort of, for those of you who recognize that reference. But as our society moved into single homes and suburbs, many things changed. And you can read books and books on the rise of individualism within our culture, how it's changed all kinds of things within our lives. But if you think about it for your own life, in our society, in our city where we live, there are two places that most of us live our lives. The first would be at home, and the second would be at work. Maybe some of them are switched, depending on the hours you put in. And you may spend more time at work than you do at home. And for many of us, there is no third place where we meet people. We used to live in tight communities a couple of generations ago where we had corner stores and local restaurants and places where you would gather. But now, I want you to think about it. How many days or weeks or even months can you go where you never see anybody from work except at work and and from home except at home? You may go out to restaurants regularly. You may go shopping at different places regularly. But we all go out to strange and different places. And I can think of occasions where it will be weeks without seeing anybody from church. Even though I'm out everywhere and they're out everywhere, there is no common gathering place for the people that you spend the most time of your life with. There is an opportunity for a church, our church, to be a third place. A place where we can gather with people who, from our home and from our work and those we don't have any other relationship with and create community and family and fellowship. Church can fill the void that is left. It can be the third place where people from all over can gather and learn from each other and grow together. You can go back to the passage that I mentioned from Romans chapter 12 or look at some of Paul's other letters and he talks about the gifts that each one of us carry that we need each other to fulfill all of the requirements of the body of Christ. We need to have this third place where people who are different from you and different from me all gather together with the same purpose and have all found a place to belong. We are far better together than we will ever be on our own. A church can also be like a store but one which wants to make us an owner. In the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' words before he ascended to heaven are often referred to as the Great Commission. He said to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He told us to go out and take what he has given us to the world around us. Now, I recognize that many of us are here for one reason or another. And some of us are here because of the things that are offered to us. We have an amazing children's program that's happening right now in the basement. And it's a good thing to find a place where we can take our kids to grow and to learn. We want to find a place where we can grow and learn, where we can engage in worship, where we can find a small group and uh, people that we can pray with and pray for 
and grow in our our understanding of the Bible, we want to find, just like we go look for a store, things that are meeting some of our needs. Stores, however, want us to return and continue to return to buy their goods to use them up. And even though we are meeting needs as a church, there's so much more to it than that. As you engage in church, as you develop and put down roots, it changes. It changes from finding out who Jesus is and growing in him to beginning to share that with others, to making it your own family and your own church. In essence, it takes us from being like a store to where you are coming and being served to becoming one of the owners engaging in the life and community and family of the church. Our commission from Jesus is to go and make disciples, our students, baptizing them in his name. Now, it's good that we meet needs, but we need to continue to grow. It's called discipleship. Church is also like a hospital, but one in which the doctors and nurses are also the patients, if you can imagine. Some of you may have a funny picture of laying in a bed and seeing someone else with their the lovely hospital gown hanging open at back, coming over to help you in the bed next to you. But in essence, that's what church is. Again, in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about how we are all sinful, fallen people. How we are all separated from God and stuck in the same place with this cancerous condition of sin. But we don't stay there. We find forgiveness. We journey out. And our lives are slowly changed one step at a time. As we learn, as we grow, as people help us. We learn about our condition. We slowly and sometimes quickly learn how to overcome it. We live through the trials of life. The loss of loved ones, of addictions, of fear, of hopelessness. And then with time, sometimes a little and sometimes a lot of time, we too get the privilege of helping someone else walk through that same condition as well. Another person once said that we are all patients admitted to the same hospital. We've just been here a little longer and we can show others around. Church is like a hospital, except one in which we are all here to help each other overcome all of those things of life that can really beat us up and take us down. Church is also like a club, but one that is for the benefit of members and non-members. In the first part of the Gospel of Luke, and for Jesus' declaration when he declared that he was the Savior, the Messiah, he came before the church and he said that he was here to set the sick to heal the sick, to set the prisoners free, to restore our sight, and to break the chains of those who are oppressed. This is for all people. He could have said, I have come to straighten the church out. We're not just a club. Jesus didn't come just for the church. He came for all, and the church is here for all people. He came to change the world, to help those who needed help. And he calls us to do the same thing. He calls us not only to grow ourselves closer to him, but to help those who are yet to know him and understand him, get to know him and understand him. Church is also like a school. However, it's about transformation, not just education. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to one of his early pastoral protégés, Timothy, he said that all scripture is useful for teaching. We can learn from this book. We can learn things that help us in our daily life, help us in the world that we live in. But the purpose of it is not just to grow our minds, But he goes on to say, so that all people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's about transformation, not just education. 
And if you haven't, I encourage you to grab one of the calendars that are on the welcome desk on your way out, and it talks about what we're doing over the next four months in our Sunday services. Because this is kind of the key to that planning ahead. That this series on money is bringing, that starts next week, is bringing a perspective of what God teaches about how we handle our finances. And he has an awful lot to say. The Bible actually talks more about money than it does about love. And so I think there's a few things that we can learn through that series together. Following that, we have a series on relationships that was planned well before this Christmas season. It starts on Valentine's Day. And then we're going to talk about the power of Jesus over Easter. And then we're also going to have a mental health uh, series following that. All of that you can see on the bulletin. But we do these things because the Bible helps us to understand how to live better in each of these ways. Helps us to understand how we can live with our money in the world that we live in, following God's grace and love. And in our relationships, and in the power that we have available to us through Jesus, and even in the things that seem new in our world, like the things that go on within our own minds, Nothing is new to the God who created it all. And he has something to say about almost everything. So we can learn from scriptures because God knows how he created us. And we're really not that different of people than those who lived and wrote this book thousands of years ago. Church can also be like a family. A family that is open and and ever-expanding and working together. We need to know and we need to understand the world which sees us by how we interact with one another. In Jesus' final prayer before he was arrested and then crucified, he prayed to, the, to God that we would be recognized by the world around us by the love that we showed for one that we show for one another. Our church should be a place where we can come with all of our imperfections, all of our cancerous sin, if you will, and gather together and learn how to overcome and heal and restore, full of grace and mercy, just like the families that we have in our homes. Now we recognize that it's never easy, but that's part of living life together. That's part of why we are here, is to help each other. So what can we do today, and tomorrow, and the next day, and the day after? I think we need to first put God first. We are the centerpiece of the world he created. He created everything and Adam and Eve to govern it all. But we also need to make him the centerpiece of our lives. There was a German painter named Adolf Menzel lived in the 1800s and is well known for a lot of paintings that he did during that time. But there's one hanging in a gallery in Berlin of a picture. It's a king and his commanding, all of his commanders, his generals. And he started painting this painting, and he put great detail into all of the generals in this painting. And then right near the middle, near the front, there's a white blank spot. Painter Adolf Menzel died before he finished that painting. And so it's a painting with no king and all of these generals in perfect condition standing around this white blank spot. Some of us, that's how we treat our spiritual lives. We think we need to get all of our ducks in a row, all of our generals perfect, before Jesus will come and be that centerpiece. I just pray that. We don't die before we find out that really Jesus is the one that should come first, right? And all of those other pieces come into place after that. We don't want to be remembered for the one who painted all the generals and not the king. We need to put him first. Put God first. We also need to commit to church. 
because we need this gathering more than we realize. Some of you may have heard this um, story. I've seen it so many different places. I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes the point of what I want to want to say today. And it, it's about a church grower who wrote a letter to the editor of a newspaper. I've seen it mentioned. It was here in Canada, the U.S., and England, and all over the place. But follow with me. It was like this. A church goer wrote a letter to the editor of a newspaper and complained that it made no sense to go to church every Sunday. He said, I've gone for 30 years now, he wrote, and in that time I've never, I've heard something like 3,000 sermons. But for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. So I think I'm wasting my time and that the priests are wasting theirs by giving sermons at all. This started a real controversy in the letters to the editor column, much to the delight of the editor of that newspaper. It went on for weeks until someone wrote this. He said, I've been married for 30 years now. In that time, my wife has cooked some 32,000 meals. But for the life of me, I can't recall the entire menu for a single one of those meals. But I do know this. They all nourished me and gave me the strength I needed to do my work. If my wife had not given me these meals, I would be physically dead today. Likewise, if I had not gone to church for nourishment, I would be spiritually dead today. True or not, I don't know. But the point of it, I believe, is absolutely true. There are so many times where I talk to different people who say, you know, I'm spiritual, but I don't think I need to go to church. We need to go to church. We need people with the same purpose and passion in our lives. And don't forget that they need us too. I think it is so important. And I won't be offended if you don't remember 30 years from now every one of the sermons I've ever preached, because I know I won't. But I know that each one I prepare and each one that I get to listen to changes who I am. It feeds me. Jesus talked about our daily bread. This gathering is important. We also need to love others. They need us and we need them. We need to make disciples. This is how patients become doctors. And it's not hard to do. It doesn't require any special training or degree. It's about coming alongside of someone and encouraging them and helping each other do the things of life together. We also need to remain faithful. God is always, or has always, remained by your side. Sometimes this one is hard to remember. We have to remember that it's the world that we live in that is broken, not God. God has always loved and cared for and sought after you. And in the middle of your pain and your joys, He is always with you. We need others to help us remember that it's the world that we live in that is broken, not God. So I don't know about you, but when life is hard, he's so easy to blame. It takes me remembering through my scripture reading and through the life of this community that he's so much bigger than that. And I want to finish with a passage from 1 Thessalonians 5.14. It's on your blue sheet as well. It says, We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and most of all, be patient with everyone. I invite the worship team to come back up. We have a final song to sing. But that last line, be patient with everyone, is important. Because we are a third place, 
because there's only one other person here who I work with, and she's about to sing. There's a few people who I live with, but all of us come from different places and different histories and different backgrounds, and we're all on this journey together. Let's be patient. Let's encourage one another. Let's share the joys so they're doubled and come alongside of the sorrows so we can share those burdens with others too. There's a great kingdom to build. There's a great kingdom building that this church is doing already. I hope these words are not are seen as an encouragement because I think in many ways we're doing a lot of this already. And I encourage us to keep on doing it in the days ahead, too.